Welcome, everybody, to yet another episode of the Nailed It Ortho podcast. I am Dr. Cole. I'm one of the hosts. And today we are uh, we have a great episode in store for you all. And I would actually like to uh, welcome our guest, Dr. Hamid. Welcome. Uh, we are uh, happy to have you. And so welcome to the Nailed It Ortho podcast. Thanks, Wendell, for having me. Appreciate it. And uh, I think this talk today is it's a little bit different than the normal talk that we do, but it's a talk that... Um, a lot of people don't think about till the end of residency or fellowship or when they're just about to start uh, start practice. And that's kind of the business of orthopedics. So I'm, I'm looking forward to this. It'll be a little different, but I know it is something that'll, that I hope will help a lot of people out and at least get people starting to think about this. Sure. So to be honest, Wendell, I am not a business guy. I, I don't have an MBA, but I, I found this mostly to be a terrifying topic when I went into practice and something that I was definitely... Uh, outmatched in when I was negotiating my contracts. And so uh, it's something that I have taken upon myself to learn about. And the more I've learned, the more interesting I found it. And I think that this should be part of the core education for residents. And so that's why I wanted to chat about it today. No, I, I agree. And I, I think it's a very, very important thing. You know, there's so many, all these different topics that we talk about, you know, talk about ACLs and, you know, shoulders and everything, but this is a, you know, a huge part of orthopedics. So I'm looking forward to the talk, but before we get into that, uh, we look kind of just like to start off asking just a couple of questions again and know you and, you know, done some research, found out you do foot and ankle, you're a foot and ankle specialist. What made you choose foot and ankle out of all of the, uh, the, the different specialties that you could choose from? Sure. Uh, I loved ankle fractures. It's one of my favorite things as a resident. And so it's actually not much more <laughs> involved than that. Uh, okay. I, I was one of those people who, uh, who liked most everything that they rotated on, but I uh, really enjoyed uh, fixing broken ankles. And so uh, that's where the love for this began. I also found that it was an area that was uh, ripe for doing research. And so uh, it married well with my research interests too. Okay, cool. I mean, I, I like that. I mean, I like doing... Um doing ankle fractures too. So I don't know, yeah. we'll see. I still well, have a little time. I used to tell, tell people that uh, I fix, uh, fix broken ankles on uh, Monday through Friday and I break ankles on Saturday and Sunday. <laughs> a little like basketball that. humor to start off. I like day. that. No, no, that's a good one. Uh, I, may, I may use that or um, uh, I'm going to store that in my, in my back pocket. Um, next thing, I, since we kind of kind of went into a little bit, but what interest do you have outside of orthopedics? And I know you do a couple of things, so whatever you want to talk about. Sure. Uh, so when I was in college and medical school, I used to do stand-up comedy and I had actually won a competition as the best college comedian in the country and open oh, wow. for some fam famous people. Uh, and then I got into residency and life really wasn't that funny anymore. <laughs> so I gave it up for a while. Uh, when I got into practice, I realized that I was just grinding every day and uh, I a few years went by and I realized I didn't have any hobbies actually. And mm. research doesn't count as a hobby. And so um, I just thought about, well, what do I like? And I always found uh, photography really intimidating. I thought I might uh, try my hand at that. And uh, the second thing was I, I, I like music, but I had no formal education in it. And specifically, I really love rap music and hip hop. And so I just thought, well, this is probably my midlife crisis, but I'll give it a shot. So I formed a small record label called Underground Funk Records to try to support local artists here in Chicago. And uh, one of them got me on to rapping myself. So I am like a pretty mediocre rapper, <laughs> and, um, but I have uh, made some, some songs, many of which have to do with orthopedics or medical school. And we actually have a new song we're shooting the video for, so called On Call Resident. So um, anyways, so uh, photography and hip hop are the two things that I do outside of, uh, outside of medicine. And I, I wouldn't say mediocre. Like I, I, I listened to the song, you have a pretty good flow. You know, I, oh, don't, yeah. don't sell yourself short. Your flow is pretty nice okay. and you have some good, well, uh, good puns. And I, I liked it. I liked some of the punchlines <laughs> that you had. It, it was good. I, I enjoyed it thoroughly. I, I liked it. And I think I commented on it too. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I appreciate it. That's the, I think, the Dear Program Director song that I sent you. Yeah, once in a while, I get lucky and I can spit some hot fire on the mic one day. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I, and I have to, you know, assume or, or do you do you incorporate that, that kind of comedic, comedic side of you 
uh, or the comedy side of you when you incorporate with patients, when you talk with them, do you joke with them a lot? Or, I'm just curious for that. Yeah, absolutely. So I tell the residents that work with me that being funny is not important, but having a sense of humor is incredibly important. And uh, when you're dealing with patients, it's a little bit different. There are some people that they're not there to laugh or hit me with someone who has a sense of humor because they come to you because they're in pain and they're worried and they want some help. Uh, at the same time, I think there certainly is something important to uh, to breaking the ice with them, making them feel comfortable. And sometimes it's not always being funny, but just at least showing up with a smile and having some positive energy. So uh, I, I try to feel the room and if they're okay with, you know, a small little joke here or there, then I, I go for it just to, just to make people feel less nervous so that we can get onto the business at hand. Um, and if they're not into it, then I just try to be nice and, uh, and, and smile and be polite and, and move on with telling about what's going on. Yeah, I think, you know, you know, having that attitude and having at least a positive attitude and coming and smiling and interacting with patients, I think that leads to a better overall experience. You know, when a patient looks back at their doctor experience, they'll remember, you know, laughing and smiling and it being something positive. And I think that, you know, in itself, you know, plays a big role. At least I think it can play a role in how, you know, in how patients do it. Just, you know, just the outlook on um on medicine or their con condition or their situation, I think can have a, you know, a bearing on, you know, how they overall tend to do. Absolutely. When you walk in the room, you set the tone for the rest of the visit pretty much within the first couple of seconds. So if you walk in looking dejected and, uh, and grieving, then they're going to assume things aren't well. And even if you're exhausted and it's been a long day, and this is your 445 patient that you're seeing at 545 PM, uh, yeah. it's important to come in with some energy. It's not their fault that you've been dragging all day or you had to see 50 people in clinic, you know, and they've been nice enough to wait for you. So I try to enter the room with uh, some positive energy every time I get in there. And I think uh, there's a, there is a, a fair amount of research in ortho that shows that people that have mood disturbances or depression do uh, worse with their care. And so while you can't really change that, what you can do is change the tone in the room and perhaps making a little bit more positive tone will help a little bit. I'm loving it. These little tidbits, I hope that you know people are listening. I think we have a lot of residents that listen, some med students and some attendings as well. And I think there'll probably be a lot more you know fellows that listen to this episode. And I think just those tidbits that you just, they just went over are, um, are, are key and those, those just little things can help, you know, make all the difference. Yeah, absolutely. Now, um, switching, switching gears into our topic of the day, we're going to kind of talk a little bit more about business and medicine. So uh, what are some of the things, like, I guess, how should, when somebody's thinking of, okay, they want to look at the business side of things, what are some of the questions that they should, you know, start to consider uh, when deciding what they want to do? Sure. So when people hear the topic of the business of orthopedics, uh, I think initially they think that this is going to be a talk about dollars and cents and uh, about how greedy orthopedic surgeons can squeeze more out of the hospital or the practice <laughs> or the insurance company. But it's really not about that at all. It's about how uh, can you get to where you want to be in life. Uh, all of us have worked really, really hard uh, to get to the point of being an orthopedic surgeon. And uh, now it's time for you to get the fruits of your labor, in my opinion. And so the first question that students, residents, uh, fellows, attendings need to ask is what do you want in life? So if you are going to get into a cab or an Uber, uh, you need to have a destination on there. And if you don't have a destination on there, they're going to just take you somewhere and it's probably not going to be where you want to end up. And the same thing about going into practice is you need to know what it is that you want in life. And you shouldn't be embarrassed or ashamed to ask that question. And the answer is probably not, I want to be a world famous joint surgeon, or I want to do this minimally invasive spine surgery. The answer is probably, I want to spend time with my kids. I want to uh, do these things outside of work. I want to build my parents a home. These are probably the answers that people actually have. But we are conditioned in medical school and residency to put the patient at the center, and that's fine and that's wonderful. But uh, we don't oftentimes put ourselves in our own uh, mental
mental health and our own wants and needs uh, at the forefront. And my opinion is that if you're not happy, then you're not gonna be able to help people. And if you're burned out, you're not gonna be able to help people. So you need to really ask yourself what it is that you want in life. And if you wanna be able to spend a lot of time outside of work doing things that you, uh, that you enjoy or spend time raising your children, then that's something you should understand very early on and you should figure out which practice would be the one that is best for that. So I think that's the question, the first question that people need to ask is what is it they want in life? And so from there, do you kind of like divide it into, I guess you could say like subsectors, like, you know, one aspect of a life is relationships slash family. Another one may be uh, maybe activities or, or fun things you like to do. And then another one may be I don't know, the actual finance part of it? Like, do you break it down into that and figure out what you want out of each category? Is that kind of how you look at it in your head or how you think about it? Uh, I think you absolutely can look at it like that. Uh, the way I look at it is you should just figure out what's gonna be fun and what's gonna make you happy. And uh, at the end of the day, as much as we as surgeons like to compartmentalize things, uh, all of this melds together. And so you have to figure out one elegant solution that works for everything. Okay. And is there a certain, I know sometimes, you know, you may think, well, what do you want to do in five years, 10, 15, 20? Is there a certain time mark that you think may be a good time mark to kind of say, well, what do I want in this period of time? And then if there is, why do you say that period of time? Yeah, I think 10 years is good um, for, uh, for if you're a resident, probably, because that's going to mean that you're a few years into practice at that point in time. Uh, it's hard to think like, what do you want in 30 years? Because in 30 years, you have no concept as to what your life is going to be like right. in 30 years. First of all, robots are going to be ha doing half of what we're doing, if not more. Uh, the second is that you're going to have arthritis and not be able to do some of the things that you want to do, probably. So right. I think 10 years is a really great mark uh, and, and a great target. Uh, the problem with five years is like, well, you may still be in training. You might barely be into practice. <laughs> yeah. And so um, I think you need to give yourself a little time for that to marinate and get to the to what you want to do. So I think thinking about uh, this is a 10 year mark is an important thing. OK. And so, you know, we, we think, you know, we say, for example, I'm person X and I've thought to myself, you know, in 10 years, I want to have three kids and be able to drop them off at at work or I used to be able to pick them up and, and spend some time with them. I want to be able to have a practice or, or be in some type of uh, institution making X amount of money. Um, and then I want to be able to do some of these extracurricular activities as well. What are some of the different, I guess, channels or um, uh, employment models that, you know, as an orthopedic surgeon that you can, uh, that you can mainly look at? Yeah. So there's really, three fundamental employment models. Uh, we could take a look at those now. Um, this is a real simplified uh, chart, but the first one is called a physician-owned practice, and you'll hear this called private practice. So the term private practice can be very confusing, but what it's referring to is a medical group that is owned by the doctors. Okay. And one of the nice things about this is that you get autonomy. So if you own the group, then you can understand, uh, uh, then you, you get the option to dictate what your life is like. Now, the tough thing about it is that you take on a lot of risk. So this is like owning a car washer or a Subway sandwiches. It's, if it's going well, it's really awesome and you can make a lot of uh, money. And that making that money can make it so that you have a lot of time off to do things that you want to do. But when it's going tough, then it's really hard to make a living because you accept all that risk. So the pandemic is a really great example of when things can go south very quickly for a private practice group. You get paid by profit. And this means that uh, you collect a certain amount of money and then based on what you collect, uh, you're gonna get paid. And we'll get into this a little bit later. Uh, this is a little different than making what are called relative value units or RVUs. And that'll be a different part of the discussion. But this means your group charges the insurance company or the patient a certain amount and you get paid a certain amount for it. And uh, that's how you make your living. So it's, uh, it makes a lot of sense. It's how businesses are run in other sectors of industry, but um, physicians are not, a, a lot of us that are not in physician owned practices are not used to it. I, I was a, a partner in a physician owned practice and it was really wonderful. The thing I loved most about it was the autonomy. 
uh, when I worked at Rush. Um, but now I've switched to a different model and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, the second model is called a hospital employment model. And now you work for a hospital. You're not necessarily teaching residents. You're not necessarily teaching medical students, though you might, but you really get paid for the work that you do. So if you have a lot of patients and you're working all the time, then you'll do well. Uh, you don't accept as much risk. Now, if your volume drops precipitously, then you may be accepting some risk there. Um, but at the end of the day, you clock in, you clock out, and, um, and it can be a really, really great option, especially for people who want to spend a little more time outside of the hospital and not really worry so much about uh, being a physician and running a practice, uh, as, you know, and running a business. Uh, the university setting is a little bit different. I say you get paid to create. Now, truly, you get paid to do work, and you get paid on all the same things that the hospital and the physician of practice uh, folks are getting paid for. But you also get paid to create knowledge, so to do research. You get paid to create the future by educating medical students and residents. And there's usually not a whole lot of risk. People are not quite as busy. They can be incredibly busy in university, but in general, it's not like a physician-owned practice where you're owning things. And if the company takes a hit, then you take a hit. Um, so one of the really wonderful things about being a physician to own practice is when you first start off, you're probably going to be an employee of the practice, and you're going to probably start off at a salary that's a little bit lower, but your ceiling is very high. You can make uh, a lot of money if that's what you're into. Um, at the hospital and the university settings, you'll probably start off a little bit higher as far as salary because they want to recruit you and attract you, but the ceiling is maybe a little bit lower. I should say this with the caveat that for all of these, you're making probably more money than you'll ever be able to spend in a lifetime. Yeah. And so for, and, and these going to the things like, you know, from what I've heard, I guess you could say is for hospitals, for example, if you want to work at a hospital system, they may start you off with a, with a, you know, a big salary. And then sometimes it may be dependent on how much you bring in or, uh, maybe can you can you touch on that because I always hear things you know that that say yeah. you could start off with this but it depends on how productive you are and if you aren't as productive in those two years you may owe money versus not owe money and they may go down on your contract what are, I guess what are people talking about when they when they talk about that absolutely that's a great question Linda. so the standard generally is that the first two years or so of your salary are guaranteed now, there will be some groups where they will say, well, if you don't uh, make this amount, uh, then you need to pay us uh, your bonus back. You need to pay us this, uh, you know, your part of your salary back. Um, and that can be in the hospital practice or physician on practice. Uh, so that's a real sticky area because they can put it in your contract, but depending on certain labor laws, it may not actually be enforceable. So if you are someone that gets paid on commission, let's say you sell mattresses and you get paid on, uh, entirely on commission and your, um, your mattress company pays you $2,000 a month. So that is not actually a salary that's called a draw. And so you get a draw of 2000, which is kind of like they're prepaying. You. So if you make less than the 2000, uh, uh, then what they can say is, well, you actually owe us that because you're getting paid on commission. Now, physicians are not paid on commission. Uh, and so like we don't get, uh, in general, uh, paid like that. And so in the first two years when you're an employee, you can't actually, uh, you, you shouldn't have to pay that sort of stuff back. But, um, you know, I, I don't, I'm not an expert on that. And there may be some ways where labor laws allow that to be skirted, and you actually do have to pay that back. Uh, after the first couple of years when your salary is no longer guaranteed, and let's say you're working as a hospital employee, and they say, well, your salary now is going to be based on what you use. And let's say you spent two years there and you hardly have any patients whatsoever. Well, they don't really want to pay somebody who's not doing any work. Now, that may have nothing to do with you. You may be working your tail off trying to get patients, but there's just nobody to be had. Um, then you can run into a little bit of a problem because your salary may take kind of a hit. Uh, a lot of places will also have hybrid models where they say, we're going to, uh, we're going to give you this base salary and then the rest of it is going to be based on bonus. And so um, that may provide a little bit of cushion for, for that scenario where you're not busy enough. Uh, one other thing I should add, Wendell, is that these are, this is a very black and white way of looking at 
uh, you know, compensation models and employment models. Uh, the real world has lots of areas of gray. There's a lot of these privademics models. So uh, my uh, former employer was a privademics model at Rush. It was a great system that they had over there. And so the orthopedic group was physician owned, but they had a great relationship with the university and uh, they still taught um, medical students and residents and fellows. And so not everything is not just as crisp and clear as it looks like on this chart. Yeah, and I was going to ask about the pyrodemics models. Is that, does the university help, does the university pay the physician to, do they pay them like a teaching fee for having residents in that pyrodemic model? I guess, how does that, uh, I don't want to get all the way into the weeds here, but just, I guess, overview, how does that general model work? Sure. Uh, the overview is they might. Uh, I think generally, pyrodemics models, uh, don't involve a whole lot of payment from the university. They may subsidize some of the research stuff that goes on, and some of the education stuff that goes on. Uh, for example, perhaps paying a portion of the program director's salary or associate program director's salary. Generally, it's not a lot, but it might be a little bit to subsidize uh, that amount of work. Most of the physicians in that practice are probably just going to be paid mostly uh, by, uh, by their collections and by the things that the group owns called the ancillaries. Uh, we can talk about that in a little bit, but I think there's a lot of variety in there. So I hesitate to give too solid of, a, solid of an answer. It probably depends on the uh, individual private demics model. Okay. And so, you know, say we're, you know, they're chief resident or a fellow starting to think about looking at a job. What are some of the questions that you need to ask when you're starting to look for a job? Sure. So I think that you can find lists of really specific questions about you know, how many partners there are and uh, you know, when do you become partner, et cetera, et cetera. But I think we should start off with some real simple questions. And the first one that um, I encourage you to ask is, how will my success be measured? And so it could be based off collections. So collections are different from charges. Charges are what we tell the insurance company or the patient that they need to pay. So let's say you do a certain surgery and the charges are $5,000 uh, and that gets submitted to the insurance company. The insurance company may say, that's great. We're going to pay you $1,000. And so the collections are actually $1,000. The costs are something else entirely. They are how much it actually costed the doctor and the practice to provide that care. And that's a very complex question. But charges are what you actually charge them. Collections are what you actually receive. So um, we generally don't get paid based or measured based on our charges. We get paid uh, measured on our collections. Uh, if we think about it, the, uh, why that's important is because you may charge um, a really uh, high paying insurance company $5,000 and then they pay you $2,500 back or you may pay an insurance company that doesn't really pay much uh, $5,000 and they pay back a thousand. And so this is called payer mix. So if you go to a practice that has a real, uh, we'll say good payer mix, I, I think we should say high payer mix might be a, a better way to look at it as opposed to assigning it good or bad. Um, then uh, you get paid a little bit more for doing the same amount of work. If you go to one that is a little bit lower paying payer mix, and you get paid less collections for doing the same amount of work. And when we uh, talk about payer mix, you mean like uh, a practice that mostly has, you know, patients that have this type of insurance that pay more versus another type. So it's, it's kind of the different insurance types that are uh, that that are accepted at a, a facility. Is that what you mean kind of by the payer mix? Yes, that's okay. exactly correct. So okay. the payer mix is the type of insurance and then um, it's oftentimes it's private payers. So within private payers, meaning like Blue Cross Blue Shield, et cetera, like uh, there's a little bit of variation, but um, they all do relatively, pay relatively well. Uh, then there is uh, the public payer. So that would be things that are run by uh, CMS, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So that would be Medicare. And then next in line would probably be Medicaid. Um, and then after that, we have um, people that are underinsured or uninsured, and obviously um, that's, that's going to be real tough for those people to probably pay pay some of their bills. Uh, okay. Other way, other ways that we can be measured are based on what are called relative value. That's for RVUs. 
And you will probably hear the term RVU discussed by your attendants a lot. Uh, RVUs are units that are assigned to the um, amount of work that is done. That may be based on how much sweat or how much risk is involved. But at some point in time, uh, a guide came out that said, we're going to assign fixing a hammer toe this many RVUs. We're going to assign fusing three levels of someone's spine this many RVUs. And it's a way to try to um, calibrate everything. Uh, the, so if you're getting measured on relative value units, then you're getting measured for the amount of work that you're doing. And the payer mix is somewhat irrelevant and how much collections you get is somewhat irrelevant. You're really just getting paid uh, to do the work. And so the um, great side of both of these is for collections, it's that you're, this is like a business and you're running it like a normal business where you're um, trying to keep the, the business profitable so that you can help people who can't pay. Uh, relative value units, uh, the great thing about it is that you're getting paid to um, to just help people and not really, and it takes the business side uh, off the uh, table for you, so you don't really have to worry so much about that. Uh, I would tell you that uh, many practices have hybrids of these two. Yeah, that's what, that was going to be my next question. So even private practice, you can still get paid by RVUs. That, in my head, I normally thought that was a hospital thing. Hospitals will pay you RVUs, but you can even private practice. Even in private practice, they may use the RVUs um, to try to make things a little bit more equitable. So if uh, somebody is in a slightly lower paying um, specialty, but they like you know, foot and ankle or pediatric orthopedics, orthopedic oncology, but they contribute a tremendous amount um, to the value of the group and they allow the group to say, you know, we take care of everything and they're really um, great as far as uh, the depth and breadth of the group. Then um, so what some groups will do is they will add in a component of relative value units to try to capture um, how hard these people are working, even if um, they are seeing some underinsured people and even if they are doing some things that maybe don't collect as well. Okay. Are there any other, um, what's some other questions that you may, you may consider as far as, you know, going into a practice and they say, you know, you may be the second or third person that they've gotten in the past four or five years, or are there any questions that you may ask them at that point? Right. So the next one you want to ask them is, uh, how did the last similar surgeon you employed do? So they may not have hired, so you're a, a sports medicine doc. They may not have hired a sports medicine doctor in a while, but maybe they hired somebody who did uh, joints uh, in the past year, or, uh, or they did hire a sports medicine doctor, but it's been four years. You probably want to know how both of them did. And um, they can de-identify the information and show you what last few people did. But what you want to know is uh, what was their volume like? Did they get busy really quickly or did uh, it, it take them a while? Or did they never get busy and they left? Um, if, they, if they did make a bonus, what was it like and how did they get there? And then if this is a physician-owned practice and they want to become an owner in the group that's called being a partner, um, what was the track like them for getting partnership? When did they make partner? So I think those are all important questions to ask. Right, and with partners, that's something that, you know, each practice differs. You can say some maybe five years to in order to qualify to be able to buy in as a partner, another one maybe 10 years or so. Yeah, so um, I would say probably even shorter uh, time frame. So a lot of times it is uh, maybe a couple of years, like two years, something like that, two, three years. Um, but five is certainly very reasonable as well. Um, what, and that's a, a very um, interesting term that you use that uh, I will explain if people haven't heard of it, which is uh, buying in. So what this means is that if you're going to become an owner in the group, then you need to, uh, they will allow your sweat equity, meaning the hard work that you've done to count as part of your buying part of the comp company, but they may also expect you to pay a certain amount to be an owner in the company. And the reason why is because you are going to then enjoy some of the passive income or ancillary income from uh, things like physical therapy, MRI, CT scanners, uh, durable medical equipment, uh, surgical centers, uh, things that you don't actually have to work to get money from. So they don't just give that away. Okay. You need to like pay a certain amount to, again, if you were going to, if you were running a car, uh, uh, yeah, a car wash, 
you would have to probably pay him a certain amount, even if he had worked there forever to become a part owner of the car wash. And so it's a similar type thing. Uh, and how much you buy in can uh, vary between groups. You might have to take a loan from the bank or what they might say is, uh, we're actually going to um, siphon this off with it from your salary. And so instead of it truly being a buy-in, they call it a withhold because they actually just hold however many hundreds of thousands of dollars from your salary over a certain number of years so that you can buy. Um, okay. Yeah. And, and so when, you know, when we're looking at it, you know, thinking about joining a new practice and we're trying to figure out what that, what the, what they want from us or what they expect from us, what are some things that we should be, uh, that we should pay attention to, sure. you know, that we should note. So the next question on the docket is what am I expected to do? This sounds silly because you would think, well, you're expected to be a joint surgeon, you're expected to be a spine surgeon, but it's actually a more nuanced uh, question than that. It is, why are they hiring you? And so it could be because the last uh, joint stock is drowning and she needs an extra uh, partner to help her out. Um, it could be that they want somebody to manage some of the lower end of the payer mix and uh, liberate the senior partners to do more of the high end of the payer mix. Uh, it could be that they're trying to expand and they're opening up a new location. And uh, it could be sometimes you know, it's a hand, uh, they're trying to hire a hand surgeon because uh, the other hand docs are getting burned out and they want somebody to share the call with. And so um, you should find out what your expectations are. Uh, the call expectation is an important one because um, if you're gonna be taking call every other week for the year, that's not gonna work. Um, if you only take call, uh, once a year, then you might ask like, why are not taking a little bit more call? Because sometimes call can be a really good source of uh, cases and business when you're early on in your practice and you haven't established yourself. Um, so I think these are all important questions. If you are starting in a new location, um, you might wanna try to get a little more information as to why they believe that's gonna be successful and why you'll actually have patients over there. What you don't wanna go is go to a new location and be sitting around twiddling your thumbs. Right. So you want like, you know, practices, say, for example, you know, hey, you know, we'd love for you to join. Uh, you can we have a great location located about 100 miles from here uh, in a small town. You know, we'd love for you to set up shop there. You know, you'd be like, you know, that may raise some flags to kind of answer, you know, ask some more questions like, oh, what do you mean? You know, this this new location, like what exactly, you know, why? Why do you think it's going to be profitable or why would it make sense, et cetera, et cetera. So, sure. no, I really like that point. Yeah, and they. Uh, oh, sorry. The the, nope. the new location. It, it may be. Uh, it, you should you should ask a lot of questions with that one. But at the same time, it might be a really really great opportunity as well. They say, well, we want you to come to the northern suburbs of this city, and um, every you know everybody is doing really well over there. We already just sent one guy out, and um, and and they're doing really awesome, and we anticipate you'll do really well for these reasons. So it's not always a bad thing, but you should always, but you should certainly do your due diligence. Okay. And a little bit earlier, you mentioned something about ancillary income and physical therapy. And can, can you kind of touch on, for those listening that have no idea what ancillary income is, what is it? And what are some other things or sources when you even looked at passive income? I, you know, what are some other things that uh, in practice or in, you know, in a job that you want to be able to look for? First things first, these are uh, things that none of us are taught in medical school or residency. So it is perfectly fine not to know what they are. I'll, I'll try to give my uh, simple Texas Aggie explanation of what they are. So we would say that uh, your income or active income, as we like to think about it, is stuff that you work hard to, uh, to make those dollars. So it's seeing patients in clinic and doing surgeries for us as orthopods. Passive income is one where you have made an executive decision to be part of a business. And this business makes money without you necessarily being too hands-on and um, you get paid the dividends of that. So that's what we call passive income is you're not actually actively doing something to get it. The other term that you'll hear called is uh, ancillary income. And ancillary just means that something that is not part of the the core business for you. It's not part of your core practice, but it's on the outside. It's an ancillary service that's provided. Um, and so one of the questions that you should ask is, um, are, are there things that the group owns? Like you know, we talked about physical therapy, imaging, 
durable medical equipment, um, surgical centers? Are there things that the group owns that I can then enjoy the ancillary income from because I'm part of the group? Um, and so that is uh, a great question, usually for private practices, but sometimes also for hospital employment models. At universities, it's generally not going to be there for you. Uh, the second question would be, um, can I own an ambulatory surgical centers? And uh, so this is, uh, we could sit here and probably talk about ambulatory surgical centers all day, but um, I think that that is an important question because it is a good source of passive income that is part of a business that you really understand well because you're a surgeon and so you understand how surgery centers work. And maybe we could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, and for the ambulatory, is it general like, or is it typical, you know, for these ways to, you know, for these passive income measures, is it typical to be able to do that, you know, well, as soon as you join a practice, say, okay, well, you know, I'm going to join here. I want to go ahead and, you know, buy part of this or maybe within a year, or is it typically like, okay, after you're been working somewhere for a couple of years, then you're able to do that. Like what, I guess is a typical thing people should expect or think about that. It's usually after you make a partner that you will be able to enjoy in these ancillary services. Uh, owning an ambulatory surgery centers, if you if that is separate from what the group owns, then you might be able to do that sooner than later. But if the group owns something, in order for you to get uh, the benefits of that, you probably have to own part of the group, meaning you probably have to be a partner. So it's usually not right off the bat. Um, as far as the ambulatory surgical centers, it's uh, when you when you're fresh out of fellowship, you may um, uh, be a little terrified at the amount that it costs to buy into an ASC. And so you may hold off on that for a little while. You may also want to just make sure that you really like the practice that you're at before you uh, decide to commit a fair amount of money to a, an ambulatory surgical center. Okay. And since we're on ambulatory surgical centers, um, what are, I guess, what are some of the considerations? And I know we have a, you know, different, a couple of topics we want to touch on as far as ambulatory surgical centers, but what do you, what do you think is important to consider? Sure. Uh, and I think probably should, I should take a step back and I forgot to really define this because uh, I will tell you that I don't think I really knew what an ASC was when I was a medical student and didn't even really know when I was a a resident because we didn't have an ambulatory surgical center where I did my residency. So an ambulatory surgical center is usually a freestanding center that is uh, not necessarily attached to the hospital uh, where they do outpatient surgery. So ambulatory, just you know, meaning people to walk. So it, it's like just a, it's a code term for outpatient surgical center uh, and it gets abbreviated to ASC. Now you can have an ambulatory surgical center that is connected to a hospital. And sometimes it might be connected by a hallway or an underground hallway. And that is, again, a very nuanced thing where they can say that it's an ambulatory surgical center, but they can actually charge a hospital outpatient rates, um, which means they can collect a little bit more for doing the same surgery. Uh, and that is a, a very nuanced thing that may be going away, so probably not worth our time right now. What we should, the question we should ask though, is why do they want you? And so when you get into practice and you become a, a partner or you're at the beginning of your employment and they say, yeah, you can own part of an ASC. Uh, and then one of your partners comes to you and they say, hey, uh, we'd like you to join our, uh, our ASC, which is uh, in the suburbs. The first question you need to ask yourself is why do they want you? And so we can probably go to the next slide um, and we'll go into the, the three reasons why somebody would want you. So the first is because they want your business. So they have um, six operating rooms. They keep them humming most of the time, but there's a few times uh, every other Tuesday of the month and Friday afternoons where um, they are a little empty and they want your business. So you have to remember for every dollar that the surgeon gets paid, the center may get paid three or four or $5. And so your business, especially if it's a good payer, is, is very valuable uh, to the ambulatory surgical center. So the first thing is that they want your business. And this could be a win-win situation because you're uh, a young surgeon and uh, you may not have much operating room time. And these people are saying, hey, uh, we want you to come over here and bring us your business. And we're gonna give you a little bit of OR time to slide into. And we'll also, if you really like it over here, we'll give you the opportunity to buy into the surgical center. Mm, 
And again, that's typically after a couple of years of being at that practice, unless, you know, for example, your, your, your mentor per se is a person that owns a practice or something that is in it like special, um, like special situations, but typically it's after a, a little bit of while. Yeah, most people, they're not going to buy into an ASC until they've been in practice for a little bit and they understand what their practice is like. Uh, okay. However, they, they may come to you day one of your practice and say, you should come over here on you know, Tuesday afternoons, second and fourth Tuesday of the month or something like that. Because they regardless, they want your business. They may not want your money, but they do want your business. Yeah. Um, so a second reason would be they need your capital to help keep the lights on. So capital is a fancy word for money. Um, and so this, they might say, Hey, why don't you come on over and, um, you can buy into this practice and, um, we will, uh, you know, we're going to give you one share and we're going to charge you X thousand dollars for it. Um, and you're going to own, you know, one thirtieth of the practice or something like that. And, uh, it might be because they want your business, but then they also are, uh, you know, they may have hit a little downturn. Maybe they had a maybe they had a doc that left that was doing a lot of volume, and so they're hurting a little bit for cash, and so they need your capital to help keep the lights on. So this could potentially be a win-win situation, but it might also be uh, it might be a lose situation for you. It might also be that this is uh, this surgical center is just not in a part of town where people want to go to have their surgeries. It might be that the management company is not doing a very good job of running it. It may be that everybody else is um, uh, taking their business elsewhere. And so um, sometimes you, you need to um, have your ears perked up uh, to try to identify why they're asking for you to join. Um, and this leads us to the last thing, which is they're going to leave you. And this mm. is probably a win-lose situation. It's that, um, for some reason, they have decided that they bought into the surgical center, they bought their shares when it was uh, $50,000 a share, and now um, their shares are worth $300,000 a share. And lo and behold, there's, another, there's a new ambulatory surgical center that is opened up across town, and they have the opportunity to get in on the ground floor over there. And so they're going to uh, go ahead and leave you holding the bag over here uh, while they move to the new place. And this is a very nefarious consideration, but it's also, it's, it's a possibility. I hope it doesn't really happen too often in real life, but it is a possibility. Yeah. I wouldn't even um, have thought of, of thought, thought of that last point, but no, I mean, that makes sense. So, you know, like, Hey, come, you know, come by in and then, you know, they go across the street and, and, you know, there's a brand new place that's right, you know, downtown where there's a lot of traffic that a lot of people definitely want to go and, yeah, their outpatient surgeries at. And, um, and I think you mentioned a point earlier, and I, I think I heard some other attendings talking about it one day, but so it may change. Like, so if you're, for example, if you're just a surgeon, you're doing the, and you're doing a surgery, you may get paid $1 or say 1000 versus a surgery center getting paid 5000 or so for that same surgery. So a benefit to being a partner is say, for example, if you're a partner in that, in that surgery center where you're doing a surgery, you get made paid you get made you may get paid that thousand that you normally get plus you may get paid for example just just to throw out another another thousand or two from being part of the owner of the surgery center is that that's kind of is that kind of how that goes or when you when you think about you know when you're thinking about i guess the payments of being a uh, part of the owner that's correct uh the second number is probably not going to be that high because there's right. so many uh owners in the group usually uh, but um, you are getting paid a certain uh, small amount for uh, for having at your surgical center. Now there are these things. Uh, there's a thing called a Stark law, and Stark law uh, prevents uh, doctors from uh, forcing patients to get certain uh, get uh, certain services that only the uh, that they could get elsewhere. Uh, but the Stark laws don't really apply to uh, ASCs. If you have, I believe, over a third of your practice that, is, that goes over there, so it is very much legal and allowed. And I don't even really, and and I think it's uh, can still be very ethical. Uh, so I'm not, um, I am not arguing the ethics or morality behind it. I think it's perfectly allowed. But um, but uh, yes, absolutely, you can uh, benefit a little bit from bringing your patients there. Okay, and next next topic, I know we could probably spend like you know hours talking about contracts but do you have any high points or or maybe things to look out for when 
trying to negotiate a contract. I know you mentioned a little bit earlier about, you know, when you first started out that you didn't know too, too much about the contracts or you weren't as privy about that as you are now as far as negotiating contracts. So in your experience, do you have any, you know, any stories or any, any tips for negotiating contracts? Sure. So uh, the biggest tip that I can give you is to find an attorney that uh, does, uh, that specializes in medical contracts and is licensed in the state that you're looking to, uh, or, or as I should say, is familiar with the laws for the state that you are uh, looking for your job in. So if you don't get anything else from this whole talk, it is find an attorney for this contract. Don't try to read it yourself. You, you should read it yourself, but don't try yeah. to be the only person that reads it because we were taught how to read uh, medical uh, literature and that's our own language. And um, legal literature is a different language that we don't speak. And so um, there may be some little subtle things that you're just not able to pick up on. There are certainly gonna be laws that you're unaware of. There may be things within your contract that are actually illegal, but end up sliding through because nobody really knew about it. Mm -hmm. And whether those are enforceable or not is a, is a separate question but it's certainly good to know exactly what is in your contract. Uh, uh, so I have uh, a healthcare attorney named uh, Ted Myers, who is absolutely fantastic and has experience in medical contracts. And, um, and so I would say, no matter what the cost is, you should get a great attorney. Uh, and what you should do is go find somebody who does medical contracts. And um, you don't need to cold call, just talk to one of your attendings or talk to one of your uh, colleagues and see if they know somebody who's really good. And, um, and so this person can be incredibly valuable to you. Uh, there are going to be things in there that you should keep an eye out for, such as uh, a no compete radius. And so that might be an important thing for you. So when I came to Chicago, uh, there was a certain no compete radius in my first contract. And I wasn't really too worried about it. Ted told me to get that down a little bit, just in case I decided that I wanted to switch jobs one day. And I, um, I uh, wasn't too worried about it because I thought, well, I'm not from Chicago, I'm from Dallas, Texas. And if things don't work out here um, at this job, I'm just gonna move back to Dallas. Well, what ended up happening was my whole family ended up moving over here. I really <laughs> loved Chicago and, um, and I really loved my job uh, uh, at the first place. It wasn't about that, but it was just that I was ready for the next act in my, uh, in my career and I wanted to be involved in hospital leadership. And it was hard to be involved in hospital leadership when I didn't work for a hospital and work for a private right. practice. And so that's the reason why I left, but it was really important that the no compete radius had been brought down because it allowed me to look at other places um, that I wouldn't have been able to look at otherwise. So the first point is find yourself an attorney. Second, look at the no compete radius. There's a bunch of other things, but what I will tell you is this, is when you're negotiating a contract, it should not be all about the money. Uh, so there is this uh, saying that I read from a great marketing book that said that struggling companies uh, spend money uh, to save, excuse me, struggling companies spend time to save money and successful companies uh, spend money to save time and because we can always get more money, but we can never get more time. And so when you were negotiating a contract, you need to think back to the first question you asked, is what do you want in life? And for most of us, it is to do, uh, it is to be happy at our job, but it's also to be able to do things that are outside of the job. And so instead of asking for more money, you should look at things that will help you get more time back. And so that may be asking about getting uh, ancillary help, like a, a nurse or a PA. It may be uh, asking about getting uh, OR time right off the bat, things like that. So you sh uh, it's okay and it's fine to negotiate for money, but I think it's better to actually negotiate for time. I think that is a golden tidbit that you just said is because I'm a big believer that you can always get money back, but you can never get your time back. So, you know, negotiating time, I hope, I hope if you weren't paying attention listening, I hope you go back and listen to the last two minutes uh, because that was gold. And you literally took almost every question I was about to ask and answered it. Uh, but one thing for those <laughs> that are that are listening that do not or this may be their first business ortho thing that they've listened to. Can you explain what a non-compete clause is? 
Sure, a non-compete clause is, um, is one that says that if you decide to, to part ways with your employer, um, that you're not going to pose an imminent threat to their, um, to their profitability and their survival. And so it generally has uh, two claw, uh, it has two components. The first is a radius, uh, a no compete radius. So this is uh, in miles and those miles can be um, highly variable. It could be something as little as two miles from the locations that you worked at or it could be something where they say it is 50 miles from any clinic or operating room where any of our doctors work. Um, and so if let's say uh, you work for, uh, let's say you have that clause in somewhere that, and you work for a company that owns um, clinics all throughout a certain state, you may not be able to work in that state anymore. Uh, whereas if you have one that seems maybe a little bit more favorable towards the physician and says that it's only two miles from where you worked, then that seems reasonable. Uh, the second thing, part of it is a time component. So there's a, a distance component and there's a time component. The time component is generally for like one year or two years, you can't work within that radius. And then after that expires, you can actually come back and work really close to the other place if you wanted to. Um, but most people are not going to leave a job and go, you know, 15 miles away for one year and then come back and find another job that's across the street. So usually they're really too effective. So as far as the no compete or non compete clause goes, two components, a distance component and a time component. Okay, love it. And I definitely love those those tidbits on negotiating contracts. And it's moving forward, what you know, there's a lot of people that listen to this that may actually just be starting to set up their practice and figuring out what to do. Do you have any tips as far as setting up practice in your first year, um, and, you know, finishing fellowship or for those that didn't even do a fellowship that are going straight into a job? Any tips for them? Sure. Uh, so the tips that I would have are ones that I learned from my uh, partners uh, when I was at Midwest Orthopedics at Rush, who all run really phenomenal practices over there. They're very lean and efficient. Uh, so what I would say is it's uh, as far as hiring somebody to help you out, uh, I think you should hire sooner than later. So that's important. If you, by the time you feel like you need to hire somebody, it might be a little bit too late. You're going to be so swamped that you're not going to have time to train them in your vision. You um, mean like a PA or, or, yeah, or an assistant? It, okay. Exactly. The, but I will say this, the first three months or so of your practice, it's okay if you don't have any extra set of hands because the first three months of your practice, you are figuring out who you are. You're discovering your own identity. So that's your, your bedside manner, what that's gonna be like, how you decide to treat things non-operatively, how you decide to treat things surgically. You're not even probably gonna know which suture you're gonna use on the first day uh, yeah. in practice or how you're gonna set up the lights in the OR. So the first three months or so, you are just uh, trying to figure out who you are. You spent five years in residency learning from great attendings and you have all these different ways, 20 ways that you learned to do something. Then you went to fellowship and you had world-class attendings and they taught you five ways to do something. And now you have to figure out what's your one way that you're gonna do things um, and what your algorithms are. So it's hard to teach somebody else to be like you when you yourself don't know who you are. So I'd say the first three months are self-discovery. Um, and then after that, you um, try to hire somebody sooner than later. That way you have some time to train them. And a quick question, when you're, when you're looking to hire somebody looking for a PA, may, this may be a technical aspect. How do you find a good one? Do you, you just like put the word out, say, hey, I'm looking for a PA. Or do you use, I don't know, I'm sure you don't use Craigslist, but I'm sure there's some other professional network. Um, but how do, you, how do you actually find like a good one? Yeah, that's a great question. I have over the course of uh, my short career so far, I actually had three PAs, um, wow, okay. usually uh, two at a time. And then uh, one ended up leaving for, uh, for reasons that were unrelated to our, our practice. And so we hired mm -hmm. another one. And I tell you that I just, uh, I hit the jackpot all three times and I got some really great advice from some of my uh, senior mentors at, uh, at Rush. But um, it's, it's hard. I'd say the place to start off with is just to uh, ask around and ask people you know. So if there's other physician assistants in your practice, then to talk to them. 
to network with people at PA, uh, see if they can network with their colleagues at PA schools. Um, also, you'll have a, a human resources department as well. Um, you'll know within the first couple of minutes of the interview whether you and that person jive or not. And hmm. you got to remember that whoever you hire, like this is your, uh, this is your voice uh, to the world. This is the first person that they interact with oftentimes before you, whether that is an administrative assistant or PA or a nurse. And so this person has to represent you. And so de facto, they need to get along with you as well. Um, so anyways, you'll know very early on in your interview whether uh, he or she jives with you, but then you can start asking some more questions. Um, it's also probably a great idea to let them spend a day with you or a half day with you, because this is not just about you wanting to work with them. It's also about them wanting to work with you. And yeah. if they realize that they don't want to work with you, that is absolutely okay. You know, yeah. like I'm, I'm not for everybody. If they don't want to work with me, that's all right. But it's better for both of us to find that out early. And uh, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds here, but it piqued my interest. Um, are there well, any two or three questions that you that you realize, you know, during your interviewing these different PAs that you've asked or that you make sure to ask? Are there some to go questions that you that you, I don't know if you want to call these weed out questions or questions that you're like, OK, well, you know, this is probably not going to be a, a working relationship. Are, are there any any couple of questions that you typically ask um, each oh. PA on your interview? Yeah. I ask the same questions that we asked at the beginning. So I ask them what they want in life. I ask them what they see their life being like in 10 years. I ask them what their hobbies and interests are, what they like to do outside of work to decompress. Uh, so I think these are all important questions to ask you to really holistically understand what that person is about and what they're looking for. Um, ideally, you would like to find somebody who views this as being a career rather than just a job. But in fairness to uh, in fairness to whoever you're interviewing, whether it is an, again administrative assistant, PA, RM, um, all of us, even MDs, we view this as our career. But there are times when it certainly does just feel like a job. So don't hold that too much against them. Okay, I think that's awesome. I think those are all great, um, great points. And I hope again people are, that are listening to this are taking notes because I know I am for sure. Uh, and we'll be referencing back to this when it's my time to start setting up a practice. But uh, before we wrap up here, can we kind of just quickly go over like what private equity is? You know, as I, I'm actually curious myself, and then we'll kind of just dive a little bit deeper into it here in a second. Sure. Private equity is a very terrifying term for, for doctors because this is an area where we all feel very, very outmatched and uncomfortable. We spent four years of college, four years of medical school, sometimes some research time, five years of residency fellowship, learning all about diagnosis and how to fix broken people. And we didn't really figure out how to fix broken systems along the way. And so private equity is very much a, a, a term that many of us don't know about. And so anyways, we could, uh, I'll be happy to talk about this question. Um, I get asked about a lot and I, something I didn't really know a whole lot about until the last couple of years. And so um, we'll just start off with this, which is that uh, somebody comes to your company and uh, it offers you a lot of money. So you gotta figure out why they wanna do this. So let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. So there's, um, when you're starting a, a company, um, which is essentially what a private practice group is or an ambulatory surgical center is, um, and this is what really, or, or even a hospital, um, when you're starting a company, there's different ways to, to get it started um, or to keep it running. And the first is to self-finance. And so that's part of the buy-in for many of us. A lot of us don't want to really self-finance or bankroll our, our companies, but that's one option. Um, the next would be uh, to get a loan from a bank. You have to pay some interest, but if you're going to be really successful, then who cares? Um, and the last would be what's called an angel investor. And I call these amateur investments because these are investments that don't require a whole lot of analysis of what the business is like. Self-finance is like, well, I believe in myself. The bank loan is, well, they know you're a doc, so they're going to know they're going to get their money back. And an angel investor can be somebody who uh, invests as little as $1. Like, you don't have to be a billionaire in order to be an angel investor. And, um, but angel investors can come in two flavors. And the one is the amateur, the one that doesn't, um, that perhaps is saying, well, you know, this is actually my son, or this is my cousin. 
and I'm going to invest in their, uh, their business that they're asking about. The next type of investment are professional investments, and this is where we start getting into this. So you can also be an annual investment investor that um, this is their job, and they do their due diligence when they look up companies and decide whether and how much they want to invest. Uh, the next would be what's called venture capital. Um, and venture capital are often groups that will fund startup companies. Um, and people that they think are going to have really rapid growth. They try to get in on the ground level. Uh, and the last is private equity. And private equity is a little bit different. They sometimes will approach um, existing companies or incumbent companies um, that are, uh, they, they believe have the opportunity to become even more efficient and they want to help them out. So we'll give an example. Um, we'll go to the next slide, I think. Uh, oh, well, excuse me. <laughs> the question that actually we should <laughs> ask is, why do ortho groups want private equity involved? This yeah. is, and this is maybe for the people that are in practice in, uh, in private groups that uh, may be listening, this might be the most important question of the day. And so the first is because the, um, the ortho group needs help competing. Everybody is getting bigger, faster, stronger in the area and they wanna be able to grow as well, but they don't necessarily have a really deep core chest um, and they don't wanna take away from their dividends at the end of the year because that's how they get paid. So they need help competing. The second is that they would prefer cash upfront just in case the practice doesn't do well in the future. So maybe they're getting cannibalized by a really, excuse me, rapidly growing uh, practice uh, up in, you know, uh, in the suburb somewhere, or maybe, uh, doctors are getting paid less to do more work. And so they're worried that they're not going to make as much in the future. So they say, well, we'll take the cash up front as opposed to in the future. The last is because the leaders of the group are planning on retiring at some point in time. And this is uh, actually part of an exit strategy. So I'm not mm -hmm. saying any of these are good or bad reasons. Um, I'm not assigning negativity or positivity to them, but these are often reasons why people, uh, ortho groups will want to get private equity. Okay. Um, so let's uh, figure out what private equity is, because at this point we're just been talking about it as this nebulous financial thing that doesn't really make much sense <laughs> to any of us. Pretty so much. This is a, yeah, so <laughs> let's start off with the words private equity. Equity essentially refers to like ownership of something, and private means that these are oftentimes private companies or the money itself is private. So that's uh, not coming from the public sector. So this is where the term private equity comes in. So. And private equity can be, it can be uh, two people that have put a bunch of money into um, a private equity fund. It can be actually um, a bunch of people's retirement funds that they don't even know are invested in a private equity group. So there's a lot of places that private equity come from. But private equity does have people that, um, that run it and that invest the money based on what they think are sound principles for growth. So okay. we're gonna start off here and we say, this is your practice. So. Um, so Wendell, you and I have a practice and oh, somebody yeah. comes to us and they say, hey guys, um, we would like to uh, invest in your practice. And they offer us this like real like a gigantic amount of money. And we say, well, that sounds pretty good. Let's learn more about this. And so um, they form a, what's called a management services organization or MSO. And the management service organization um, actually buys all of our non-clinical assets. So this means, Wendell, that they buy everything except you and I. So they buy our CT scanner, our MRI scanner, they buy our DME store, they buy our uh, ambulatory surgical center, they buy our administrative assistance, they buy everything except for us. Like they um, own it. They own it for us. They, they, own pay it. It. Okay. they actually pay it because um, they're going to manage it and run it for us. And all so right. they say, they say, um, you guys, uh, you don't worry your pretty little heads about running this practice. Your core competency is diagnosing people and doing great surgeries. And our core competency is running businesses. So you just let us do this and you pay us a small amount and we'll run the group for you. And they actually pay us a, a very large fee. Let's say they could pay us $120 million, something like that. All right, now we're wow. talking. This, yeah, now we're talking. <laughs> well, what happens is the $120 million um, Actually, um, part of it, uh, it goes into uh, building up the practice and making it bigger, faster, stronger. And so they're investing it in themselves. 
part of it goes into being, they say, well, we're not actually gonna give you cash. We're gonna give you some shares in this management service organization. And this is really smart of them because it incentivizes us to be productive and to make a lot of uh, cash so that the MSO makes cash. And so we can get part of it back because we are part owners of the MSO. It's really smart um, on, their, on their part. And then um, the last thing is to say, well, we're gonna give you, you know, uh, a few million dollars cash each. And um, let's say there's actually a few other partners as well. So we each get uh, $2 million, but I think it's taxed. And we're, you know, we don't have to take a whole lot home, but we say, man, this, this sounds good. We don't have to worry about the business side. Um, and then what happens is they say, well, actually we're gonna spend part of that 60 million on buying other practices up as well. And these are called add-on practices or tuck-in practices. And um, so what the MSO will do is they say, well, you know, our core competency is running businesses. And we looked and you have some really talented people that run your business, but there's some people that are not probably needed. And so they get rid of some of the administrators um, and they say, well, you know, these add-on practices or tuck-in practices, they do stuff that is very, very similar to what you do. And so there's not really any point in them having their own administrators that are duplicating the same efforts. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, um, we're gonna mix their administrators and we're gonna keep everything housed in this MSO and the MSO is gonna run all of the practices. So the platform practice is like the main one. It's the one that has a great footprint, great reputation. And the add-on ones are maybe the smaller ones that are in the surrounding areas and they form this one big um, nebulous. And so anyways, that's kind of generally how um, a private equity firm works. But what happens is that in about five to seven years, they decide that they are going to um, sell the practice. And what they have done is they've made it really lean and efficient and it's made them some money. And they're gonna sell it to somebody who's gonna pay them a lot of money for it. The way they were able to capture us is because they said, we're gonna give you a lot of money. And we're also gonna maintain your clinical autonomy. So Wendell, you're gonna maintain your clinical autonomy. If you wanna take, you know, every Wednesday off, that's fine. If your uh, kid goes, their soccer team goes really far in the tournament, you need to uh, knock a day off, no problem. You do whatever you wanna do. You wanna hire a PA, not a problem. You can maintain your clinical autonomy, but we're gonna run the business. What happens yeah. when they get sold to the second group? So it may be a larger private equity firm, or it may be a hospital, which we were trying to avoid anyways. Um, then we may lose the rest of our autonomy at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So when they sell the, when they buy you the first time, they give you uh, some some cash, uh, and then when they sell the second time, it's called a second bite of the apple, and it's like um, you know, big bank takes little bank. So the uh, they get bought by somebody else that's bigger, and um, they make a significant amount of money for running the MSO. They sell the MSO. And um, so they take their dividends and um, they, you know, they made the place more efficient and, uh, and they made some money off of it. So uh, now here's a really interesting thing is that all the money that they invested may not have actually been theirs. They may have borrowed it and got a loan from a bank. And so when uh, of the 120 million, 30 million shares may have been uh, in the MSO, but that wasn't real money. 30 million was paid up front to us. And maybe the other 60 million was actually borrowed. And so they made a $120 million investment, but they really only put in 30 million. Um, the rest of it was either shares or it was borrowed. And when they borrow money, it's called a leveraged buyout. Um, so borrowed money equals leveraged buyout. And um, so they just actually pay back the bank plus the interest and whatever the difference was, that was a pure profit for them. Mm. So that okay. is how private equity works. It's a little complex and there's certainly much more to it. Uh, again, I'm not assigning um, positivity or negative negativity to it. And certainly this may be a slight oversimplification of it, um, but uh, that's kind of generally how it works. And that's probably the, the good version for uh, five minutes on an org pod podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that was good. I, you know, I, I am not too well versed with private equity. So that's something I definitely myself have to read up on and, and, and kind of study some more to really understand it. I, I, I was keeping along with what you were saying, but I was like, man, I got to read up on this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Of, it's probably its, its own podcast one day, but um, it's, you know, it's for most of us, 
this is probably far beyond what we actually need to know about private equity. If you work uh, in an academic medical center, it's probably not ever going to end the conversation. A hospital may be, um, but in a private practice, almost certainly there will be some discussions uh, in this climate. But anyways, so. No, I think that was great. And yeah. so, so Dr. Hamid, what if you're, if, you know, somebody's listening to this and they just listen to this podcast, we went over a lot and we, we, we touched on a good amount of uh, great facts and tidbits on different parts, but what is one thing that I know we said one thing earlier on, on negotiating contracts was getting an attorney, but what is an, one other thing, you know, if there's anything else that you want people to get away from listening to this podcast, you know, as far as an intro to business and orthopedics, uh, what's something that you want them to, to take away or at least consider when they're thinking about business? Sure. Um, it is to educate yourself. So the purpose of life is to be happy and, uh, and to also to spend time with your family and loved ones. And so you should ask yourself, what do you want in life? And it's probably something that lines up with that. The reason why you need to educate yourself on business is because most of us are not taught um, these things in, in college or medical school or residency, um, at least if you're going down the medical path the whole way. And um, if you don't educate yourself, you're going to uh, probably end up working um, really hard and maybe not earning what you need to, uh, what you're entitled to. And that's going to, it's not that you don't make enough. That's like not my worry. It is that you're not going to have enough time to to spend with the people that you want to spend time with. And so I think it's very important for us to get educated in this. Uh, I am happy to chat with anyone who wants to talk about the business of orthopedics. Uh, if you have ideas for startup companies, then you should pursue those. And that's probably a whole nother uh, discussion that I'd be happy to give. But uh, I think you should really strongly think about what you want in life and how can you get there. Well, Dr. Hamid, I think this was a, a great podcast episode. I know I will be re-listening to it again uh, in the future. And I may even pick your brains at some point about, you know, the startups. That's something that, that's piqued my interest uh, for a while as well. Uh, for the people that are listening that want to follow you, you know, you can sometimes at the end, we give our listeners a way to reach out, whether they can follow you on social media, follow your YouTube channel, check out some of your videos or anything. Is there any way that uh, or people can reach out or at least follow what you have going on. Sure. My, um, so I have too many Instagram accounts. I have one for my surgical stuff. It's, uh, uh, the Instagram account is the athlete's ankle. Um, and then for my, uh, you know, outside of work endeavors, uh, I have an Instagram account. It's called This Is Comron, T H I S I S K O M R O N. My, my name is spelled K-A-M-R-A-N, but it's been a lifetime of being called uh, Cameron Mohammed instead of Kamran <laughs> Hamid. And so uh, when I was creating my, uh, my hip hop alter ego, I made it, this is Kamran, I think, which I think is also my YouTube account. But um, they can reach out to me uh, through uh, any of those means. And I, I actually have uh, took uh, a page from your book, Wendell, and okay. um, started uh, recording a web series called Doctors Who Do Things. And awesome. so uh, I may ask you to reciprocate and I just uh, I interview people who and see what kind of cool things that they do outside of medicine. I love it. That's great. Yeah, I'd be definitely, um, we'd be definitely interested in coming on and helping however we can. And again, Dr. Hamid, this was a, a great episode. We appreciate you so much for coming on. For those that are listening, I hope you go check out the YouTube channel. He has a Good flow, great flow, great lyrics. So definitely go and check out the videos. And uh, if you're tuning in this week, we thank you again for tuning in to another episode. We hope you tune in and listen to next week's episode. And uh, we hope you please, if you can, go and leave a review and tell us how much you love this episode. And um, until next week.